What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome, bike to the channel. Welcome, bike to headquarters. This is Bunk Bed Breakdowns. I am joined on my show by my co-hosts, Mike at Mike Me Up on Twitter, two Ps, and at FB God on Twitter. This is their show. This is Big Dogs' Dynasty show. Every single Wednesday, we're talking something Dynasty. Make sure that you are following and subscribe to their YouTube channel. We have separate YouTube channels for Bunk Bed Breakdowns. They have their Twitter. They have their podcast as well, which they'll be putting out a lot of exclusive content that is strictly Dynasty related that you will not be getting on my YouTube channel. So make sure first thing you do, pause this fucking thing right now, scroll down to the description, click all those links and follow all their stuff. Today, we are looking at some of the ADP data that we have pulled again, from our big dog startup leagues, which we have a lot of them. They're all paid. So this is real data. And we are looking at some young wide receivers that are getting picked near each other. Uh, some of them are second round picks, third round picks, all the way up to, I think, like sixth or seventh round picks. And we're going to look at our rankings. We're going to look at what the ADP data tells us. And then we're kind of going to uh, argue our way through which guys we like more and hopefully settle on one player that y'all should be taking over the other. Gentlemen, how are we? I believe we can brand this as the Terry McLaurin episode. We can. I mean, I'm, I'm down to, to spend the next 60 minutes talking about Terry. I'm sure the people <laughs> will get enough value out of it. I've got, I don't think we have enough uh, big facts about Terry McLaurin to fill 60 minutes. But I, I was going to say, well, in one of the articles in the draft guide, I talked about Terry. It took up like half the fucking page. <laughs> it was beautiful. If I, couldn't get, if I couldn't convince people to draft Terry after that article, there's no fucking hope. There's no were the point pages uh, were the pages stuck together? No, Mike. It is a virtual fucking <laughs> virtual. Draft well, after that, Marg incident, they might have been. That's true. I'm just spilling shit. I got pretty fucking drunk on camera when I was doing that. To be honest, they, <laughs> I kept getting. I thought I was done with peer pressure. They kept being like, "Rip one more shot, rip one more shot," and I was pouring up little shots that were like doubles. Anyways, I'm fucking done with this stuff. I'm ready to. I'm ready to roll. You guys ready? Yep. Let's hit that uh, intro. Fucker. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's, uh, let's get into it, boys. Uh, this week, we're going to be doing some versus uh, duels between the second-year wide receivers and the third-year wide receivers. And the reason why we're looking at this is because in your dynasty drafts, you are frequently going to be making the decision between choosing some of these guys. And, you know, you're, you, these are the guys that you really want to kind of build your team around, especially your wide receiver core, because, uh, they're first of all, if they performed in their first year or the second year, Chances are they'll perform again because good players can need to be good, but also they have they're they're really young, right? So there's not much difference between a sophomore and a third year wide receiver. So the choice here doesn't really come down to age; it just really comes down to value. And there's a lot of interesting decisions that we think you can make here. Um, and there's a lot of big names, a lot of popular names. We're gonna, we're going to run through it based on you know where we have guys ranked somewhat closely and then we'll take a look at the adp as well to see where they're going and, and you'll see like the decision points here are rather pretty close uh so without further ado here we're going to kick it off with two of the biggest names the biggest young studs in the game today first up my dude dj moore uh absolutely love this man I've uh, been probably standing for him for way, way, way too long. He is the quintessential analytics darling, and he's obviously panned out as well while in the NFL. But let's just rock some numbers here. So DJ Moore currently going as the uh, wide receiver six overall in BDG May ADP uh, at the 31st pick overall. So just in the middle of that third round for you guys. Um, you know, and Nick, Noah, and I all have him ranked substantially higher than ADP uh, for an average of 22. I think I'm highest at 20th overall or wide receiver five. Uh, and then Noah's the lowest at 25th overall or wide receiver seven. So not much of a gap there. Pretty, pretty strong band. And he's going up against probably the most hyped wide receiver of this year uh, of recent memory, even for me, it's, it's AJ Brown who obviously skyrocketed up ranks, skyrocketed up ADP after having a pretty historic rookie season, uh, probably one of the most efficient seasons we've ever seen. And we'll get into the numbers later, but he's currently going as the wide receiver eight overall. And we have him ranked as a wide receiver eight. Nick is highest at wide receiver six. Noah is high, uh, lowest at wide receiver 12. And I'm just behind Nick at wide receiver seven. And he's going at, 
ADP 36. So again, so just at the end of the third round. So again, these are not guys you're going to be able to get in your teams. If you do, it's because your league mates are probably idiots and they let you get them. But this is the decision that you're going to make. So I'm going to pass it over first to Nick. Uh, what do you think, man? Who do you got here, DJ Moore or AJ Brown? Well, I have them in my rankings as five and six, more as the former, Brown as the latter. And luckily, they actually align with how I'm actually feeling and how I'm thinking right now. <laughs> a lot of times, the rankings, once you get on air, are kind of fucked up. Uh, I think I, I would take more over Brown. The concern with, with a guy like Brown is, of course, for redraft purposes, you know, this year is what makes people kind of step back a little bit. It's like, will Brown get the volume he's built you know like julio jones he's built like one of these dudes who can run with the ball after the catch but dj moore seems like he is a player who's fit to succeed in whatever kind of offense he gets thrown into right like we don't know what carolina is going to be in a year from uh, a year or two from now teddy bridgewater is he going to be their quarterback same thing with tennessee they did sign ryan Tannehill, but does that mean that they're buying into derrick henry as the high volume workhorse and they just like the fact that Tannehill was good for them this year good for them last year and he's like a stable piece of that offense going forward so with Brown, it's like you need, one, you need Tannehill to be good. Two, you need some sort of volume to be there. With DJ Moore, it seems like he's going to get the volume regardless. Like he has kind of turned into that alpha on the outside of the passing game. So is, so is A.J. Brown. But I think uh, he's such a tough guy to pull the trigger on right now because you don't feel like you're going to get – the production year one, right? Like you know, it is dynasty and you do want to look long-term, but you also want the guys that you draft to produce. Like, you know, if you're drafting as wide receiver six, you want him to at least put up top 10 numbers. And it's really, really hard to buy into AJ Brown putting up top 10 numbers this year, which makes you kind of pull back. So you're playing the long game when you're drafting a guy like AJ Brown right now, whereas DJ Moore, you're, you're drafting him very highly, but you're also expecting like 1400, 1500 yards, right off the rip and they're both super young so I think both of them are good draft picks the reason I lean more is because you get more production in year one over AJ Brown who I do I do think definitely has a higher ceiling given that he's like the prototypical you know x on the outside can develop into that Julio can develop into the guy that's a deep threat but the volume is definitely a question mark if Derrick Henry continues to carry the ball you know 300 350 times What's going to happen in this passing game? So Moore seems like a better volume play. He seems like the guy who's going to give you production in year one, which can't be overlooked in startup drafts. So uh, I'm going more here for sure. Before I pass it off to Noah, just real quick on that passing volume thing, because that's something that I've been looking into as well. I think the Titans are going to pass a lot more than people think. Um, courtesy of my man, David Zach 16 on Twitter. Uh, basically, teams that, that throw for under 500 attempts, 12 out of 13. So 92% of those teams increase their passing volume on an, by an average of 63 more attempts the following year. And that's just, that's just due to team level regression. You know, JJ Zacharias talks a lot about this and team team level regression is something I'm probably more on board with than just player individual player level regression, because it's really hard for teams to just be that dominant in order for Derek Henry to keep running the ball. Like he has been it, like the Titans basically have to keep dominating. Their defense was playing lights out uh, towards the back half of the season. And their offense was playing just at a ridiculously insane red zone efficiency rate. So I think some of those things are going to change around. So that gives me some comfort on the volume side, but now I'm going to pass off to Noah. Noah, you've got him ranked at wide receiver 12th overall who, which one of your family members did AJ Brown slam? Because I don't understand why you hate him so much. Yeah, I think it was my aunt and my mom, but we'll <laughs> move on saying, from that to be a twofer. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, it's just like I it's like what Nick said, you have a lot of trust issues with a guy that sees 84 targets and that number will probably go up next season. But in that offense built around Derrick Henry, and I get what you're saying, Mike, that passing volume is going to increase. But he also didn't have much competition last year, right? It was Corey Davis, it was John U. Smith. Derrick Henry, despite what Animal thinks, has absolutely zero hands. So although this year they didn't add any weapons, you can expect in the future it's not just going to be a one-man show. Whereas DJ Moore, they had Curtis Samuel kind of sucks. Uh, Christian McCaffrey had like 116 targets. So he did uh, – he was – in some target competition with other guys on his team. They do bring in Robbie Anderson, but he just seems like such a safe floor play and a ceiling play because if his touchdowns are anywhere near what A.J. Brown did this past season, which I don't expect it to happen because he hasn't been great in the red zone and a few of his touchdowns have come from deep out, which uh, isn't really predictable year after year. But if it's anywhere close to what A.J. Brown did this past season, he's like a top five wide receiver. They're the same age. For me, like A.J. Brown, he's very similar to a Juju Smith-Schuster, who in his rookie year didn't have a lot of volume, but he had extreme efficiency. The only difference is he was on Pittsburgh, a team that we know at that time liked to throw like 600, 650 times a season. So you could expect with Martavis Bryant taking a step back, Juju Smith-Schuster taking a step forward. For me, A.J. Brown, it's a little bit iffy in that department because 
We know that Ryan Tannehill isn't necessarily the best quarterback in the league. We know that, at least for next season, they're going to be built heavily around the run. And I think in like one of our first episodes, we talked about A.J. Brown's touchdown numbers. He had nine last year. One came on the ground. Five of those nine touchdowns came from 49-plus yards out. And that is a huge part of his game, winning after the catch. But how predictable is it for half your touchdowns to come from basically past midfield? So there's a lot of question marks there with him. I still do think he is a fantastic wide receiver. Him being wide receiver 12 isn't me lacking faith in him. It's more like I like Allen Robinson more than him. He's a little bit older, but I think he's a little bit more safer. And there's a few other guys in that range like Chris Godwin, Mike Evans, that I have a little bit more trust in than A.J. Brown. So that's personally why I have him a little bit lower. And then D.J. Moore just playing in the NFC South, like week in, week out, he's going up against like soft defenses at least six times a season. So I think I have him as like my wide receiver six or seven. And I just feel really confident pulling the trigger on him in the third or fourth round just because the target volume there and hopefully with a quarterback improvement from last year being Kyle Allen and Will Greer, we see a step forward from DJ Moore. All right, we're going to spend some more time on this because this, this is a really interesting debate, I think. And it's, it's a decision that everyone is going to have to face. And so I started digging into the numbers a little bit here. But let me give you a, uh, I guess, a little, a little pop quiz here. Okay, so if you have a wide receiver that gives you 130 targets, and 72 catches and 130 targets and 80 catches in year one and year two, both above 1,000 yards, um, you know, a few TDs here and there, and both incredibly young. So this is like rookie year to sophomore year, right? Um, what do you think the value bump for that wide receiver is? So if you're in year one, you put up 130, 70, and 1,000 yards. In year two, you put up 130, 80, and 1,150 yards. Like, what, is that a top five wide receiver to you? Is that a top 12 wide receiver to you? How do you guys value that? It's hard to put that player into the top five. It's, it's always tough to pull the trigger top five on a guy that hasn't put up top five production yet, right? With both of these guys, the dynasty world is getting a lot more savvier where like if you want to get guys that you think are going to be good in the future, you actually have to buy into the, the projections. You have to buy into getting them earlier, right? Like you can't get those guys at the discount anymore, especially a guy like DJ Moore who, you know, we haven't seen him be a top five wide receiver, but we're kind of projecting him into it. So, I mean, on that trajectory, we're seeing him get more efficient year over year with around the same amount of volume. So you're getting excited about that. Um, yeah. So, so that, that was, like, that was, uh, that was Amari Cooper. So that's what he did okay. in his first year and his second year. Adrian Brown in his first year was 84 targets, 52 receptions, 1,051 uh, yards. So he had basically 19 yards less on about, you know, 50 less targets, which is just insane efficiency, right? I mean, if you look at his yards per route run, which is probably the main efficiency metric that I look at, AJ Brown put up 2.67, which is, if you put up above two, that's incredibly good for any player. Uh, but as a rookie, if you put up two, uh, two plus, that's like incredible. I think his ranks top five, like all time as of rookie seasons. Mari Cooper wasn't as good, but still pretty good. He put up 1.84 and then 1.95 the second year. So you saw that improvement. If you look at their ADPs, Amari Cooper, after his first year as a rookie, so after his first 1,000-yard season, he was a wide receiver seven. And then after his second year season, uh, this was like the 1,100 yards on the same number of targets, he was a wide receiver five. So you do see some value bump, but as you guys said, like you're, you're, you know, you're pretty close uh, to the top end here, he really needs to like smash. Like he needs to go for like 1,300 yards this year to really like return, uh, return true value at the top end. Um, but if you're just trying to bet on value, uh, I think, you know, it's a pretty good bet because I do think the Tennessee Titans are going to increase in pass volume. And I do think that AJ Brown is a really good player. And I think his efficiency will fall, but I think some of that volume will be made up for. Um, and if you look at their bus profile, it's almost like pretty similar. Uh, you know, Amari Cooper over his two years, he had 11% games in the top five, 20% in as a wide receiver one, 20% as a wide receiver two, 8% as a wide receiver three, and 42% basically bust games. So wide receiver four or worse. AJ Brown, top five, he had 6%, which is one game. Wide receiver one, 30% of the time, so slightly better than uh, Mark Cooper there. Wide receiver two, 6% of the time, so a lot less, a lot worse than Cooper. Wide receiver three, 12% of the time, and the rest, 47% bust. So they're both pretty, like, boom-bust type wide receivers. Um, but, you know, very similar profiles, very similar early on success. And I, I would predict that very early, like, value trajectory going, going forward. And we'll, we'll throw some of these numbers up on the screen for you guys thing with those guys is like that that's the that's the scary part about more is that we've seen this play out before where you have these young you, we, we see the same thing with Stefan Diggs and with Amari Cooper like the very early success and you just assume 
that eventually they're going to take the next step, right? They, they have it at such a young age that you're like, okay, we'll give them an extra year. We'll give them an extra year. But like after so many 1100 yard seasons, when do we just say, okay, the ceiling's not there. I feel a lot more confident more. I already feel like he has um, kind of surpassed what they were doing at a young age, or at least what they were doing in those first and second years. Uh, with A.J. Brown, I really think the question comes down to, like, are we simply going to look back at the end of this year and be like, yo, A.J. Brown was just so good, there was no way he was not going to get it done. Like, that feels like a very, very realistic outcome. Like, yes, the overall passing volume of the team might be low, but as you're saying, it also could not be that low. It could go up a little bit. And A.J. Brown, like, commanding targets is a talent in itself. The fact that he barely played over the first half of the year, right, he was playing like 40 50% of snaps, him playing the full year at a 95% snap range and being good enough to command targets. Like this doesn't have to be a high passing volume offense for him to get 120, 130 targets. So I feel like, I mean, I would feel great about either of them being on my team, but I do lean slightly towards more because we've seen uh, a higher volume, him commanding higher volume already. And we know the offense is like Noah said, terrible, terrible division where they're just going to be letting up 70 fucking points every time they step on the field. So it's going to be pass, 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 DJ Moore can't pass on totally agree I, th- I mean i think it's a clean sweep here like we we all prefer dj more i was just trying to present provide some insight on the adrian brown side because he is someone that i've, I've kind of like pulled a 180 on like before i thought like there's no way i can invest in this guy at this price and just mm-hmm. the more i look into it the more i feel like there is a, there is actually still room for growth um e- even if he doesn't like become a wide receiver one or a wide receiver five or whatever just looking at looking at past trajectories like people do love to buy on that youth and buy on that tendency mm-hmm. um for me though i have a little bit different view on you for like dj Moore. i don't i don't actually think dj Moore like really has like wide receiver one overall upside i think he's like a perennial like wide receiver one like a top 10 top 12 guy like every year he's just going to give mm-hmm. you wide receiver one numbers and i think that's in- incredibly valuable but he's someone where like i would love to pair him with like you know a, a, a boom receiver like tyree kill or like uh you know Devonta adams like someone that has like the td upside and the reception upside that should give you that wide receiver one overall upside but yeah if you're building around dj moore you're doing it right if you have both dj moore and aj brown i was about lost, to say it sounds shit. like it sounds like you want to uh build dj moore around the guy like aj brown <laughs> yeah exactly all right so dj moore takes round one round two uh we got a couple guys here uh calvin ridley he has been blazing in the hype train these past few weeks uh it seems like i can't scroll past twitter uh, you know, two or three tweets before I see another Calvin Ridley wide receiver one tweet. Uh, in terms of our rankings, we've got him at 51 overall at Big Dogs rankings. Uh, I think I'm highest at 48, Noah's lowest at 61, and ADP has him at 58th overall. ADP has him at wide receiver 18, and we've got him at wide receiver 20. And Look, I mean, I love Calvin Ridley. I'm sure Nick loves him too, uh, given that he plays for the Falcons. But he's going up against another guy who's also just skyrocketed up, you know, Mr. Three Cone, DK Metcalf. I mean, I remember everyone hated on this guy, myself included, uh, because because of his three cone and because we didn't think like he was going to cut in the NFL. And he kind of just went in here and pooped on all of us. Uh, he showed that even though he's not really good at everything, he is absolutely elite at one thing. And being really, 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 really good at one thing can definitely help you in the NFL. Um, he is currently going at ADP 15 overall uh, per big dogs. So ahead of Calvin Ridley. And we've got him ranked at 19th overall wide receiver, which is basically right in front of Calvin Ridley as well. I'm going to pass this off to Noah first to take a dump because obviously Calvin Ridley also mm-hmm. smashed one of his ants because he's got him at wide receiver 24 overall uh, and the 61st pick overall. So Noah, uh, please let us know how he hurt you. Man, yeah, man, he was my wide receiver too. Huh? And then I saw those Twitter videos and I just had to move him down just to make up for you guys. But the thing about Calvin Ridley and DK Metcalf, this debate, for me, I'm personally going with DK Metcalf. And it's kind of strange because the previous debate, I leaned on DJ Moore because of his volume and the fact that one plays for the Seahawks, one plays for Atlanta. Obviously the guy on Atlanta's in the sea, probably more targets because it's more pass happy offense but I'm not so sure that that's an issue here because the difference between Tennessee and Seattle is we've seen Seattle be extremely efficient year after year, throwing the ball with Russell Wilson at the helm, whether it be Doug Baldwin or Tyler Lockett. And even last year in his rookie season, DK Metcalf actually saw hundred targets, which is more than Calvin Ridley has seen in his two years in the NFL. So 
Although I do expect Calvin Ridley to see more targets than him this year and probably going forward because they did lose Austin Hooper. And although Hayden Hurst is supposed to be like the next best tight end of all time, uh, I don't think he's going to command a huge target share. I do think Calvin Ridley is going to be around that like 120, 130 target share number. But the thing for me is, and it's kind of similar to AJ Brown, is like this guy is just really good at what he does. And what DK Metcalf is really good at is using his physicality. Like that Philadelphia game in the playoffs was just a perfect example of how he uses his body and like his athleticism to just win at the catch point. I don't care if this guy can't run around three cones in fucking eight seconds. He's just going to bomb past you. He's going to jump over you. He's going to punch you in the chest. And he's going to catch the ball. And that's what he did last time. He had like 900 yards, seven touchdowns. So he proved to me last year that he isn't, well, he might be like a one trick pony, I guess, but he's really fucking good at that one trick. He does it week after week. I believe he led the league in targets directed into the end zone. I couldn't find that stat, but I remember like through week 12 last year, he was number one. So I assume he was up there. He also saw 17 red zone targets last year. And when I was writing the piece on Calvin Ridley for the draft guide, you know, he's a touchdown monster. I believe he has 17 over his first two years. But you look at his red zone numbers in terms of volume and efficiency. His rookie year, he had eight red zone targets, turned six of those into touchdowns. So obviously the efficiency was super high. In his sophomore season, the volume dipped to seven. Obviously he played less games and only three of them were converted into touchdowns. So the volume dipped, uh, probably not on a per game basis. The volume was about the same and the efficiency dipped. So what worries me about Calvin Ridley is if his touchdown numbers aren't as high as we expect them to be just based off of his first two years, looking at the raw numbers, I don't think he has the wide receiver one upside this season, at least that a lot of people are painting him to have. Whereas DK Metcalf last year saw 17 red zone targets and only converted four of those into touchdowns. And looking at how good Russell Wilson has been inside the 20 throughout his entire career in these past three years, especially being top four in touchdowns each of the last three, I'm not so sure if DK Metcalf is the worst red zone wide receiver in the league, but I would like to think that if the volume is going to stay the same, the efficiency is going to have a slight uptick. Maybe he doesn't catch more touchdowns this year because maybe he's a little bit more unlucky in the deep targets. But I think that around seven, eight targets is where his floor lies. And just being a consolidated target share in Seattle means to me that I don't think he needs 140 targets to be a true wide receiver one in fantasy. He can be a guy that sees 100 to 110, which is probably what we can project him in the Seattle offense. And I think he'll be just fine to return value there. Yeah, to go off that stat, your mans. The, uh, the, <laughs> the end zone targets, Metcalf led the league with 18 end zone targets, six touchdowns on them. And Tyler Lockett was actually tied for fourth in the league with 13 end zone targets. So Seattle had two guys within the top four leading the league in end zone targets. Uh, So I I would give a slight lean to Ridley. I think it's interesting because we have two guys who have another wide receiver that is bringing their value down, right? Like if Julio wasn't there and Tyler Lockett wasn't there, uh, I think a reasonable way to look at this is maybe how long do we think both of those guys affect the receiver, right? It's actually kind of hard to tell. Like obviously Lockett's way younger than Julio, but does Lockett affect Metcalf for the longevity of his fantasy life for as long as Julio is about to, to affect uh, Ridley? And I, I think, you know what, like th- these rankings, obviously we did a little while ago and I might need to be updated a little bit. I might start leaning towards Metcalf only because I think as long as Julio's on the field, like clearly Ridley has no chance of being the wide receiver one here. Uh, as long as Lockett's on the field, there still is a chance. You know, we talk about that the chemistry between Russell Wilson and Tyler Lockett is obviously there. But there is a chance that Metcalf, obviously, in his range of outcomes, becomes a wide receiver one there and becomes this playmaker that we never saw coming in. I mean, the rookie year was incredible. As you can see, like, Russell Wilson is a guy who throws up. He doesn't need the passing volume to score 30, 35 pass, uh, passing touchdowns through the air, right? Like, that's just part of his game. He's super efficient. He's super accurate. Um, and if you have a guy like Metcalf, who's already shown, you know, one year. He's been in the league for one year, and he didn't, he didn't play a full complement of snaps, and he led the league in end zone targets. Like, if that Remember number- he had, like, that knee injury coming into the season, and we weren't sure he was going to be 100%, and then he was just an absolute animal? He had an a- uh, abdomen strain. He had a knee strain. He, he, that's another thing I think we also need to not overlook, too, at DK Metcalf, is he had like that. And he was like LaVisca Chenault in college, basically. The guy couldn't finish a year, and then he comes into the summer, gets hurt a little bit. So I think that's something not to overlook. But he did play the full 16 in his first NFL season, so that probably kind of negates any worries that we had. Uh, with with Ridley, it's it seems like we're a lot of people are starting to – it got to the point where, like, you liked him a lot in the beginning of the preseason because he was going in, like, the sixth or seventh round, and the upside was there. But now you're kind of drafting him where all of these things that were excited – all the what-ifs are factored into, where it's like, oh, in the games where Muhammad Sanu was out and Austin Hooper was out and all these guys are out, like, look at his per-game numbers, right? And, like, 
great route runner, of course. Like that fucking video pops up, and it's like, <laughs> dude, like they're just in shorts. Like you don't even know who that cornerback was. Can anyone name who that cornerback was? It could have been a college. It dude. was Eli Apple. <laughs> probably fucking was like they, that would that would make sense given how fucking terrible he looked in the video that's the thing i hate about these twitter videos like you don't actually know who that was like most of the time it, it literally could have been like they can't get their team together so they need some college kids to come and work out with them then what then you're going to tell me that calvin ridley against a fucking guy in college like means something to adp so with ridley i mean i do i do think that there's upside but it's very situational based it's it's just the fact that atlanta and matt ryan and dirk cutter are this pass heavy offense. And if everything doesn't click right, then we're going to see a bad year for Ridley. We're on the flip side, like Metcalf kind of had everything working against him, right? He was a rookie. He's competing with Tyler Lockett. They're a run first team. If, you know, something breaks the other way and gets a little bit lucky for Seattle in the passing game, it's going to be Metcalf wheels up probably. So um, I, I think I've kind of changed my tune on the Ridley versus Metcalf thing. I need to update my rankings. So I'd probably lean Metcalf slightly. All right. Looks like it's up to me to defend your mans from Atlanta. Um, I think, look, it, the, the reason why we wanted to do these is because they are really close decisions. And I think for me, in a vacuum, I'm, I'm going to take Ridley uh, just based on pass volume alone. I mean, you're looking at a team that passes about 600 times versus a team in Seattle, uh, which is like passing, what, like 500-ish, I would say, um, under Russell Wilson. And uh, granted, Russell Wilson is, you know, much, much more efficient, but, you know, Matt Ryan isn't a slouch either. So I, I think he's also a really good quarterback. So you're looking at like 130 to 140 more targets being distributed. And, you know, everyone's seen the splits. We can throw them up on the screen. Uh, you know, his splits with and without Austin Hooper, who's scoring like 22 points per game uh, with some shit, which would have made him like basically like a top three wide receiver. Obviously, that's not really sustainable. Um, and I'm not that focused on, on that split. But I think the Sanu split is an interesting one because, I mean, regardless of all this Russell Gage hype, I, I don't think there's really any much competition behind behind Julio. So if you're looking at like 600, 750 attempts, there is plenty of targets to go around for Calvin Ridley, I think. And I think that's what it comes down to for me is like for volume. And if I'm trying to compete now, uh, I'm probably going Ridley like, you know, nine times out of 10. The one time that I will go for a DK Metcalf, for example, though, is is if you're if you're really trying to shoot for that long, long-term long upside, right? Because I, I don't really see a world where Calvin Ridley ever becomes a top five wide receiver. Uh, I think he'll be a wide receiver one. He'll be one of those cases where like he may not ever become a wide receiver one like alpha for his team, but he can be a wide receiver one for fantasy because just from volume and scoring alone. Uh, but DK Metcalf, on the other hand, like this is someone that can actually eventually make that jump and become the the alpha for his team. So it, it like it kind of comes down to that decision point for me. But more often than not, uh, I've been I've been clicking the buy on Ridley. Uh, fortunately, I've been getting him in like the sixth round up until now. I think I got him in the sixth and uh, the fade to public, fade the public or fillet the public, I guess. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm getting fucking confused one. with all these <laughs> fade the yeah. public, fillet him, fade the peasants. Now I'm like I don't know. What the fuck yeah. I do think uh, but, that's a really interesting point that Noah brought up, though, real quick, uh, about how Ridley has not capped 900 yards yet in his career. Metcalf did it in his rookie season, and Metcalf is three years younger than Calvin Ridley is. So you're getting a three Calvin year. Ridley is so old. I was looking at his 25. <laughs> he's 20, yeah. yeah, 25 and a half. He'll be 26 so regularly in yeah. fucking five he, months, whatever. And Metcalf <laughs> is three years younger, and he's already produced at a higher level than Ridley has. And I think that point comes down to uh, probably like injuries, right? We talked about DK Metcalf is gets injured sure. a lot in uh, in college, but he's been healthy throughout his rookie year. But Calvin Ridley has been hurt every single year. He has like soft tissue problems, so that's definitely something to look out for as well on the injury side but yeah i mean you it's see how close. like his knee bent on that route like the angle of that <laughs> leads me to believe his acl is out of tact just like jerry judy the alabama receivers watch out those ankles and those knees are tough. all right uh so look it looks like it's two to one for dk uh nick basically changed his mind mid talk and that's why we're doing these man we're talking these things out and we'll get our rankings updated as well um but i'm gonna go with calvin ridley here uh but we'll give the round to dk giving us two to one next up it's gonna be Super passionate battle between Noah and Nick. Uh, this is Noah's man, DJ Shark, or DJ Shark, as they say, the go-to wide receiver of Gardner fucking Goat Shoe, man. If you're still out on Gardner Goat Shoe, I mean, get laid, bro. That's all I have to say. Um, let's take a look at DJ Shark. We're pretty even across the board. We all have him at wide receiver 18. He comes in at BDGE rank wide receiver 19. That probably just has to do with like averages and all that stuff. Uh, and he's at ADP uh, wide receiver 19. So, Pretty much even all across the board in the 50s. So basically, you're looking at him in the fifth round. On the other hand, we got 
Scary Terry, a.k.a. McLaren or McLaurin F1, whatever you want to call it, a.k.a. Nick's Bay Terry McLaurin. You know, Nick loves this man almost as much as he loves Zendaya, uh, except he does not DM him back. So the relationship is not two-way. But having said all of this, Terry I don't McLaurin. don't DM either of them back. <laughs> Terry, the record. Terry McLaurin feels like a pretty decent value here. You know, Nick's got him at wide receiver 17. Noah and I, who both have vocally hated on him in the past, still have him at wide receiver 20, which is pretty respectable. He's going at an ADP of wide receiver 26. There's some value there. I'm going to let Noah kick it off for his man, DJ Chark. Why you, you should you draft him over McLaurin? This is like the battle of the worst Twitter nicknames for fucking any <laughs> fantasy asset. F1 versus Baby Chark. I hate both of those names. Is that Baby Chark? I, I gave a new one. DJ is dish, just dishing justice. Dishing justice, Chark. <laughs> that's, Off that that's alone, he should be higher than Terry McLaurin. Anything <laughs> that rhymes with McLaurin isn't working. For me, they're very close. Mike and I have been vocally out against Terry McLaurin, but I think that's more just to make Nick you're, upset. You're He's got the ball to, out. He's trying to cross to me up. feel like snacks where it's like you say the Terry McLaurin thing and I feel like I need to get angry about it. <laughs> like <laughs> you I have feel how I felt at the sixth pick in this draft. Like I don't I think there's anything TV. in sports I actually get angry about anymore, but Terry <laughs> McLaurin, I'm willing to fucking go <laughs> Curry, Davidson, fucking NCAA, put the team on my bike for Terry. I'm fucking ride or die. Let's go. Fucking dish some justice on me, bitch. I have no justice to dish. I think they're very similar when it comes down to their situation because last year, both of them had probably some of the worst quarterback luck, quarterback play for Washington and quarterback luck for DJ Chark because they went between Nick Foles, Minshew, back to Nick Foles, back to Minshew again. Terry McLaurin obviously played with a three-headed monster with a combined one hand, so they couldn't really throw the ball to him. I think what it comes down to is – whether or not you believe Jacksonville is going to have the volume to be able to make DJ Chark a bigger target hog than what Terry McLaurin will be in Washington. Because from everything I've seen, Washington isn't a team that's going to throw the ball 500, 600 times a season. Whereas in Jacksonville, with their defense just falling apart, them not having a running game, and sure, they do bring in LaVisca Chenault. But last year, DJ Chark led the team in targets despite having two other guys go over 100 targets in D.D. Westbrook and Leonard Fournette. Chris Conley somehow seeing like 90 targets. I just think that the volume is there for DJ Chark to be a safe play from next year for like the next seven years because the guy's still 23 years old. When it comes to Terry McLaurin, I think he is by far and away the best option on that team. And if we're talking redraft, I mean, nobody's competing with him this upcoming season. But when we're talking dynasty, I just don't see a way, especially with Dwayne Haskins wanting to develop. And if it's not him, then somebody else in the future trying to develop a quarterback where you have one guy that can catch passes. Because last year, their second leading receiver was Chris Thompson, who played 11 games and saw 58 looks. Like, you have to have a more diversified wide receiver and running back group to be able to support an offense with a young quarterback. So I think that as they bring in more weapons, Terry McLaurin's target share might not be as high as it was in the past. But I still think whoever they bring in probably won't rival Terry McLaurin's talent. So I think his target share will be enough for him to match DJ Chark's type of volume. I just have a little bit more faith, and this is like crazy to say, but I have a little bit more faith in what Jacksonville is doing than what the Redskins are doing. So it's, it's a real toss-up, and it's tough for me, but I'll go, just, I'll go DJ Chark just so Mike can make the decision on this one. All right. Before I pass this off to you, Nick, uh, I see your face is getting red. I'm just going to jump in here with one quick stat again. Um, the same stat I talked about with the Titans where teams who pass for under 500 attempts go for 60 on average more attempts in year N plus one. That also applies to Redskins. So I, I do think there will be more opportunity there on there on that end. But uh, in order to defend Terry McLaurin, Nick. Yeah, so in a, in a startup draft I'm in right now, I had the 5'11 and the 6'02. And I grabbed Terry at the 5'11. I grabbed Chark at the 6'02. And uh, in, the, in the Big Dogs draft guide, I do a must draft article where depending on ADP, you know, I, I tell you all the guys that I would target in like all of my drafts basically. And I'll put, I put up multiple guys this year, just in case you couldn't get one or the other. And McLaurin and Chark were both my guys for a redraft in the seventh round. So I love both of them and I'm splitting them. If it comes down to that, if I have enough leagues where I get to, you know, have that option to split them. But for me, it just seems like the position Terry put himself in last year, coming right in and demanding the alpha workload was just so impressive to me. And what he brings to the field was, is these attributes. And what happens when you have a guy like Terry who comes in relatively unknown is people take a really long time to buy into it. And then when you start digging around, you start seeing like, 
okay, this is a guy with like four, three, five speed. Okay. This is a guy who's six foot, almost 210 pounds. He's got the build, he's got the speed. And now he's put it onto the field in terms of NFL production. And like, we have guys who, you know, chart depending on like how seriously you take the shit, but like Matt Harmon does reception perception and uh, Terry McLaurin had the fourth highest success rate versus man coverage uh, in any rookie season, 76%. He had success against any sort of man or press coverage. And, you know, I, I feel like for the most part in lists like that, where you're looking at actual success versus routes, like man coverage is one of the easiest telling factors of what makes a good wide receiver good, right? Like a lot of slot wide receivers can find success versus zone coverage because that's easy to do you just have to find the right spots you don't actually have to be fast you don't have to have separation skills so seeing him rank that highly uh was not eye-opening to me because i had watched harry play a lot and he was eviscerating like cornerback ones last year left and right like this is it, i can't have seen him do that for a full year and be like oh this is fluky you know what i mean like he just looked that good to me last year he uh he had the highest pff wide receiver rookie grade since Michael Thomas in 2016. He led the entire NFL in contested catch rate last year. So he's not only beating man coverage, he is catching the balls in tight windows, which is something he's going to need to do with Dwayne Haskins. All we need is Dwayne Haskins to do a little bit more than he did last year, which is literally fucking impossible for him not to do. So I like the idea that Dwayne Haskins is not straight up um, straight up just a bust. I still have a little bit of belief in him. And if that's the case, Terry McLaurin's going to suck in 130 to 140 targets. I saw Dwayne Haskins blowing up on Instagram. He put up a stat line for what he predicts Terry McLaurin to be. And I'm taking him verbatim. I'm taking him word for word. I, I forget what it was. It was like fantasy analyst, Dwayne Haskins. It was like 100 for 1,313 touch. It was like fucking a bunch of 13s with a lot of zeros behind it. But it looked good to me. But Terry was just like, it, it's, it's, it's something that, uh, and I don't know what the ceiling really is for Terry. But I've said this a lot. I, it feels to me like he can be a legit possession wide receiver one, like Robert Woods. And he also has four, three, five speed. And we saw him break deep on a lot of long. So imagine Robert Woods, but every four or five games, he's catching a 60 or 70 yard pass. Like that's how excited I get about Terry. And the fact that he's beating this man in press coverage, like week in and week out, came right in as a rookie, getting the best coverage from the other team and having no, no problem with it. The, the biggest concern is quarterback play. That's really it. But I think on a raw, like wide receiver talent spectrum, I think it's Terry over Chark, no question. Yeah, uh, look, th this is an interesting debate for me. Both guys actually, you know, from an analytical perspective, have, hole have holes in them. But Chark obviously has a much better profile coming out of college, just given that he did break out. And Terry McLaurin, if he succeeds, will be one of the greatest analytical outliers of all time. Make no mistake about that. But the, the thing that I've come around on is, like, at what point do you, like, kind of, kind of, you know, write off some of that analytical profile in college and, like, look at what he's done in the NFL? Because as you said, Nick, in the NFL, he has been fucking impressive. Like, he put up 2.05 yards per out run, so really crossing that two yards per out run as a rookie um, coming into the league on a trash offense with just absolute garbage everywhere. The one weakness that, that Terry has shown is even though he's good versus man, he was not good versus press. So little tidbit here from my man at Dwayne McFarland on Twitter over at PFF, I think, uh, versus no press. Terry had 12.6 yards per target, 78% catch rate. Pretty fire, right? Versus press, 6.4 yards per target and 42% catch rate. So well above, well below average. And but the thing is, like that's something. I wonder, that you... I wonder instead of yards per target, if they had more advanced analytics on that because that could also be a quarterback thing. When if yeah, Dwayne yeah, Haskins sure, sees definitely. like press coverage on him, I'd I'd imagine that would lead to a lot more inaccurate or just like thrown away passes. You know? Yeah, definitely. But you know that's something that every wide receiver struggles with. Like AJ Brown, like every, everybody. Like when you come into the league, like they press you, and unless you played in the SEC against like top corners from like LSU uh, or stuff like that. Like they just don't press you in college. So that's something that's like an adjustment that he'll have to learn. That's an adjustment that everyone has to learn. So I don't really knock rookie wide receivers for that as much, but what he did do was quite impressive. You know, I actually have Chark a little bit ahead of him as well, just because like I'm still waiting that college production profile a little bit, but I have moved Terry significantly up my rank. So uh, I, I'm, I have a straight, a little bit of an edge to uh, Chark, but look, other, I've, been, I've been basically going split as well. Like you saw me, I, I drafted him in the New York City, uh, Dy New York City Dynasty League, uh, and I've been gaining some more and more exposure to Terry McLaurin over the past few weeks. It's, it's an interesting dichotomy too. I do think the fact that Jay Gruden leaving Washington hurts Terry, and it's like a double sword because it, uh, it definitely helps DJ Chark. But – also, if you look at it objectively, like one person had a team that added 
uh, receiving weapons to it, and the other team didn't at all. Like Washington, had Washington used even like a top three round pick on a wide receiver, I still would be like, I'm still in Ontario, but they added nothing, right? It was like fourth round, yeah. sixth round picks and shit like that. And Jacksonville, LaVisca Chenault, Chris Thompson, like who knows? You know, DJ Chark is obviously more of like a deep threat and a possession guy. So maybe those targets don't uh, take away from him much, but I, I do feel like that hurts his target ceiling, whereas nothing the Redskins added uh, does hurt Terry's ceiling. But in terms of like long-term play, yeah, I don't, I, it's really hard to say what the ceiling of either of these guys are. They, they, what I will uh, say for long-term play in Jacksonville is I believe both D.D. Westbrook and Leonard Fournette, and maybe – I know those two are for sure. Maybe uh, Chris Conley are free agents after this season. So maybe they do add another piece to replace one of those guys, but just strictly long-term play. And I, I do expect them to replace one of those guys, but the competition might not be as stout as we think. Yeah, I will say the Redskins tried to add Amari Cooper, and they failed. Chris Cooper was like, fuck that. I'm not playing at the Redskins. I'm staying with the Cowboys, baby. No, Amari, your foot's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, look, they're going to add someone, but at the end of the day, like, good players will earn their targets. Like, that's that's right. always been my stance. Like, DJ Chark is good. McLaurin so far has been good. If he if he if he balls out again this year, I will be all in because I will completely disregard his collegiate profile and just recognize that he's one of the one of the biggest outliers of all time. You'll um, be too late by that point. That's why you got to go all in on Terry right now. Yeah, you don't have to go all in. Uh, I mean, I went some in. I, I'm not, I didn't push all the chips in, all but in. I, I just one knuckle deep in. to Terry McLaurin. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, all right, so that's two to one, Chuck to McLaurin, but basically you can call it dead even. Get exposure to both guys uh, as soon as you can. Next up, one of my favorites. Uh, I don't know. I thought this was one of Noah's favorites, but then the ranks showed up. I was like, what the fuck? This guy doesn't believe in him at all. But uh, we got Christian Kirk, uh, the wide receiver two of the blazing hot Arizona Cardinals, tied to one of the hottest young quarterbacks in the league in Kyler Murray. We've got him at Big Dog's ranking of 78 overall, wide receiver 32. So the back end of that wide receiver three rank. He basically going right around ADP, uh, at wide receiver 34. Who is he going up against? Uh, another pretty hot blazing young wide receiver, Hollywood Brown, attached to arguably the most exciting quarterback in the NFL. Not known for his arm, more known for his legs in Lamar Jackson. Um, you know, Hollywood Brown exploded uh, in the first couple of games. I remember when, like, you know, against the Dolphins, he had like three catches for like 100 yards, and, like two touchdowns, something like that. And uh, people were drooling over him. And then he kind of cooled down a little bit uh, middle of the season. You know, he had that foot injury as well so you know a little bit of an iffy season you know very similar to Christian Kirk Christian Kirk also battled foot injuries as well uh, in his third year and also I believe in his um in his second year so these are a couple of exciting prospects I was going to let Noah defend him but he's a fraud and he has him as the lowest ranked out of all of us so I'll probably defend him but uh first I guess I only want to get Nick's thoughts like what do you think about Christian Kirk I know you're pretty lukewarm about him uh yeah I mean Kirk is Kirk is fine. I, I feel like he got too much hype early on in his career and didn't produce to the level a lot of people expected to. Um, like people were kind of as high on Kirk as like people were on a guy like DJ Moore. And then DJ Moore went out and threw up tons of production, right? Like 1,200 yards or whatever. And we'd kind of been hoping for that to be Kirk's role. And I just feel like as long as he's in this offense, now with DeAndre Hopkins coming in, like we could just say Larry Fitzgerald is going to keep getting phased out of the offense, but as long as he's there, he's still going to catch 50, 60 balls. And it's just going to, I feel like we know what we're getting out of Kirk and he's a good player. Like he's going to be really good for the Cardinals, but until something massive kind of changes on Arizona, I don't think we're going to see any type of ceiling for Kirk. So I'm, I'm definitely in on Hollywood Brown over Kirk here because I think Hollywood Brown's ceiling is, is just so much higher than uh, Christian Kirk's is. I don't know if we want to jump into Hollywood right now, but I'm ready to fucking go to bed. Hey, um, let, me just, let me just comment on Kirk real quick. I mean, the, the most appealing part of Kirk, again, for someone like me that, that does really rely on the analytics is he is someone that has a very elite analytical profile. I, I wouldn't say that people were as high on him as they were on DJ Moore. Cause like, like I said, DJ Draft Moore was like, stuff, yeah. DJ Moore was like literally the God of, of analytics. And I think film grinders love them too. So kind of like the best of both worlds, but look, Kirk, Kirk is a pretty dynamic playmaker. I mean, he was a guy who returned punts, returned kicks. Uh, he did it all. And he broke out as a true freshman as like an 18 year old. And in his rookie year, he actually did like pretty well for what he was given again, similar to someone like, Terry McLaurin, uh, who obviously balled out a little bit more, but he was stuck with Josh Rosen in a coach coaching scheme that basically got replaced halfway through uh, some of the most, like, you know, disgusting offensive play calling I've ever seen. And he was pretty efficient in that rookie year. And then he took a little bit of a step back 
as a sophomore. He, I, I believe he hurt his foot. He had that one monster game where he made me like a few thousand bucks on DFS that week. But other than that, he was, Shut the fuck he was, up. He was yeah, pretty quiet. Flex. My entire bank pretty account quiet. one week. Pretty quiet. Um, but look, like I, I think for him, it comes down to profile. And I don't, I never viewed him as a wide receiver one. So that, that's one difference that I have. I guess, uh, against other Christian Kirk truthers, whereas I think DJ Moore is a wide receiver one. I don't view Kirk that way at all. I think he's someone that could be like a perennial like wide receiver too. You know, someone that just slots in every week and gets like, you know, 120, 130 targets. And if he increases efficiency, he can be, he can be good that way. Um, so that's why I have Kirk. But yeah, I'll let, you, I'll let you jump in on Hollywood Brown here. Yeah, this is, this is one of those debates where like the other ones that we've had so far, I would probably split either or go Ridley, Metcalf, uh, would go DJ Moore, AJ Brown, a couple other Chark, McLaurin. Like I said, this is one where I would take Hollywood pretty much every time. Uh, maybe nine out of ten. Maybe I'll get Kirk in one just to kind of vary it up there. But I think if we look at this not from an analytical standpoint and look at, I guess, the landing spot for Marquise Brown. We talk about his foot problem last year. He played his entire rookie year with a with a huge screw in his foot, which has since been taken out. The Ravens took him knowing that he was going to play his entire rookie year with a screw in his foot. He was the first wide receiver off the board. And I don't know if we've seen a team draft as well as the Ravens have over the last three or four years. And what I love about, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, Marquise Brown is only 165, 170 pounds. We really don't know what he weighs right now, right? Like he could be up to 175. He could be at 165. I don't know. But we do know is if you're going to say like, oh, we've never seen this player have success like this before, like, we literally just saw them do this with Lamar Jackson where, oh, we don't see these types of players ever have success. But guess what? The Ravens have a really fucking good coaching staff. They just selected Marquise Brown as the first wide receiver off the board, knowing he was going to play his entire rookie year with the screw with the screw in his foot. He played on 52% of the snaps last year and had a 19% target share. So, yes, the numbers weren't there consistently, and he wasn't producing – at, at a level where you could actually put him into your lineup. But I feel like once you put context behind his role on that team, and he's another he's another guy where, like, they did they did add some weapons to this team. They did bring in Devin DuVernay, but he's a slot guy. That's not really where Marquise plays. Um, but he can play in the slot, too. I think, I think this is just a very good team that understands how to utilize their players to the best of their ability. So I'm not really nervous about Marquise being, like, an outlier and him not being able to have success because the Ravens, as a franchise, are pretty much an outlier, right? And they're going to find out how to have success regardless of how fucking much of their player ways and stuff like that so Marquise just seems like someone who's so explosive that uh they're gonna have he doesn't even need to be good enough to command targets he's gonna be a playmaker where they create targets for him they're gonna have a lot of plays for him and we saw last year like give him a few targets a game and he's gonna break one or two of those and be a big time player and who knows maybe he does develop into a Tyreek Hill type player like the reports so far this offseason have been that he's looked fantastic and that he's you know that he's primed for a big year obviously it's very like coach speaky but you'd rather hear that than not hear that coming off of the surgery to get the screw out of his foot so Marquise man I'm, I'm trusting the franchise I'm trusting the draft capital I'm trusting what we saw in college he's not just like this one trick pony he was a really really fucking good player at Oklahoma too all right Dude. Noah you got him at 119 overall at wide receiver 47 how many ants do you have that's question number one <laughs> no, question bro, number are they question okay, number yeah. two <laughs> why do you hate Marquise Brown and why do you like Christian Kirk over yeah, my ants haven't been walking straight in months. But, uh, <laughs> I think I was a little bit harsh with Marquise Brown being wide receiver 47. My ranks, I don't think I've updated in a month. So he's definitely a little bit higher than that for me. The thing that is a concern for Marquise Brown for me is the efficiency Lamar Jackson showed last year and him not being as good as maybe some people remember because he started off super hot and he ended super hot. Week one, four catches, 147 yards, two touchdowns. In the playoffs, seven for 126 and zero. In between those weeks, he only had four games over 10 fantasy points and seven with less than six. So it was extremely boom bust. But even those boom games weren't that great. He had one game over 20 points, only two over 16 fantasy points. And I, I agree with what Nick said, right? He wasn't dealt the best hand last year, having that screw in his foot, being a rookie, starting off injured, and like all the struggles that you suspect with a rookie. So I do expect a little bit more consistency out of him. But comparing him straight up to a guy like Christian Kirk, who has had struggles of his own, right? He played with Sammy Sleeves and Josh Rosen in his rookie year with Mike fucking McCoy calling the plays. And then he goes into his second year. He sprains his ankle in week four. He's playing with a rookie quarterback and a rookie scheme. Larry Fitzgerald is still there. They do bring in DeAndre Hopkins. But I think that the difference between the Baltimore Ravens offense, right, being built around Lamar Jackson, having Mark Ingram, drafting J.K. Dobbins in the second round, leads me to believe, and I know, Mike, you're going to bring it up again, the less than 500 pass attempts uh, reverts to over 500 the following year. 
I just think that with the scheme that they built, the fact that they went as far as they did this past season in Lamar's second year leads me to believe that they're not all of a sudden going to be a 600 pass attempt offense. And even if it's consolidated target share between Marquise Brown and Mark Andrews, I'm not sure that the touchdown percentage, the 9.0 that Lamar Jackson put up last year is going to repeat. Whereas with Christian Kirk, that offense was decent, but they weren't scoring a whole lot. They were like bottom three, bottom five in touchdown percentage in the red zone. I do think that the volume will be there enough for him to see like 100 targets at least next season. And as Larry Fitzgerald, if he ever declines, I think Christian Kirk can slot in very nicely into a wide receiver two role there, which is like 110 to 120 targets, because this is an offense that wants to run a lot of plays and throw the ball a lot, especially being connected to a young quarterback like Kyler Murray. Again, I kind of just lean on the volume argument with Christian Kirk over Marquise Brown. But then again, we saw Marquise Brown be a volume play at Oklahoma and be an absolute monster. So this one is, along with the next one, Nikhil Harry, it's kind of tough because we didn't see too much out of Marquise Brown in his rookie year. And I don't think we've seen anywhere near his ceiling. So my wide receiver 47 ranking is completely ignorant and abhorrent. So maybe I'll move him <laughs> up after this. But uh, yeah, I, for me, it's just Christian Kirk because I've been a fan of him for a while, even though I moved him down into my rankings and Mike called me the five letter F word. So <laughs> move on from that. All right. Uh, so look, man, it, it's pretty close. I know Nick loves Hollywood. Noah and I like Christian Kirk. It really depends on your, your team composite. It's, it's really tough to get, to get guys like Marquise Brown, like for, uh, for out, outside of best ball. Cause it's like lineup decisions is really tough when you don't have the target volume there. Uh, but like Nick said, man, he's got that week winning upside for you. So very few players can put up four receptions for 140 yards. So I don't care if you know what your college profile was, but if you can do that in the NFL, like multiple times, you're probably a pretty decent player. Yeah, like where you're, where you're drafting him though, like you know, you get him as the wide your wide receiver four or five, like as a flex play. Where I'd rather have a ceiling guy than a floor play in Kirk, and I, you know, maybe Kirk's more of a floor uh, ceiling guy than I'm giving him credit for. But I, I, I just don't think Kirk makes a lot of sense outside of a full PPR league because the, the volume and the targets, like he does get a shitload of targets for the production that he seems to be lacking. But like, I don't know, the the average at the target and just like what he's doing with the targets doesn't is not. Um, you know, not, not good enough, I think, to warrant anything outside of full PPR over, over Hollywood. I yeah, think, I do. Uh, speaking to what Mike brings up about, like, DJ Moore and his analytical profile, I think the difference is, and Mike, you can correct me if you think I'm wrong, is I think Christian Kirk, if he does put up, like, 1,100, 1,200 yards in his third year, that third year jump with his huge analytical profile, early breakout age, he's going to jump to, like, a top 15 dynasty receiver, and his, his trade value is going to be skyrocketing. If Hollywood Brown next year puts up a good season, like, 900 yards, eight touchdowns on, like, 60 receptions – that's a great season for him. I'm not sure that's going to bump him anywhere near where, like this is completely hypothetical, but I don't think that uh, among the Twitter communities and among the dynasty community, he has the potential to jump as high as Christian Kirkwood if both of them hit like a breakout season. Yeah. I mean, value wise, like dude, there's a lot more momentum behind Kirk, but uh, just given like all, all the stories and that, but uh, from a production standpoint, I, I totally see Nick's point as well. Like they could definitely be, be pretty close. And, but I think like, you know, Kirk, I, I totally agree with you. Like with wide receiver, you got chase ceiling especially in that like wide receiver three range, because like none of these guys are giving you like floors uh, to really, to really win the week, especially in that wide receiver two to three range. Um, so I, I get that standpoint as well. Uh, but look, next up, we got our final showdown of this week. It's going to be someone who, you know, is a bit of a roller coaster. Someone who shot up the ranks then kind of dipped down a bit, shot up and dipped down again after draft. And it's Michael Gallup, the wide receiver two or wide receiver three, of the Dallas Cowboys, depending on who you ask. Uh, BDG, we got him at 84th overall or wide receiver 33. He's currently going as wide receiver 41 at the what, 114 overall. Just total blatant disrespect. Uh, <laughs> great value from that perspective. Uh, against my boy, uh, Nikhil Harry, you know, someone that basically really fell on his face as a rookie. You know, he had injuries that played into it. You know, Tom Brady probably didn't like him. We can create a lot of excuses, but at the end of the day, you know, it was a major flop uh, in terms of a rookie season. You know, he's currently going at uh, 100th, uh, ranked 100th per BDG consensus rankings, ADP 109. So actually going ahead of Michael Gallup, which is a little bit crazy. Um, and then, you know, in terms of positional rank, we got him at wide receiver 38, ADP wide receiver 39. So not too much gap there, but in terms of total ranking value, um, look, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to just say a, a little bit on my, on my boy, Nikhil Harry here. And look, the analytical profile for him is elite. Like there's very few guys that have that type of breakout athletic profile and then dominator and granted he did at arizona state 
but he was still elite in every aspect of that game. And he was an absolute monster in college. Actually, I really love watching Akil Harry in college just in terms of what he did. And I think really early on, I compared him to Anquan Bolden just in terms of the style of wide receiver they are. You know, they're really physical and basically get most of their bread and butter after the catch. Uh, but he came in. I was excited for him. You know, my team drafted him. And then he was hurt all training camp, so he didn't do much there. Uh, and then didn't really do much in preseason either because he was still hurt. And he finally got in the field, and, you know, he showed a couple of flashes here and there, but just largely wasn't really used. You know, he was kind of uh, out-targeted by – not kind of. He was out-targeted by, like, Jacoby Myers, and, you know, Edelman was still balling. Basically, everyone was balling instead of Nikhil Harry. What I will say is, like, we know the Patriots system is just incredibly – hard to learn for rookies and also we know Brady's kind of a dick and you know he hates rookie wide receivers because you got to be exactly where you are when you need to be there whereas you know Nikhil Harry's kind of a kind of like a toss it up and watch him make a play type guy you know it's similar in like the vein of like Des Bryant who was like never really a target separator I think there's more than one way to win in the NFL and I think he brings a skill set that can win so it just depends on how the Patriots want to use him going forward. Let me ask you, like, when Nikhil, when we heard the news last summer that Nikhil Harry was going to miss the first half of the season, I immediately did not expect anything from him. Like, even yeah. when he come, if you told me he came back week nine completely healthy in the summer, if you were like week nine, he'll be back 100. percent I think at that point, rookie wide receivers have tough, you know, tough enough time making any sort of impact their first year. If you're going to miss, I. I there's there's been like stats and studies done I remember on rookies that have missed the first you know whether it was even just the preseason or uh, the first month or two months of the season with any kind of lower leg injury uh, they almost never produce in their rookie season whatsoever so as soon as I heard that I was like damn like you're just eating the L on Nikhil Harry for the first year but like that's what made him so uh, that's what that's why he's even in like the fact that he did nothing and he's still in the argument with a guy like Michael Gallup who just put a thousand yards up in his 23, 24 year old season tells you just how fucking good he was prior to the NFL. And that analytical profile is just like, it's obviously not going anywhere, right? When he's fully yeah. healthy, he's a dude that's 225 pounds running a ridiculous 40 for that size. So he's exciting, man. He's still tantalizing. And now you got Cam coming in. So things get interesting. Yep. The quarterback situation is like, does Cam turn Nikhil Harry into what he did with Devin Funches, but a much, much more athletic version of him? And I would say, like, you could use Nikhil Harry in, in so many more different ways. Like, back at Arizona State, he was a guy who was taking screens to the house. He was a, uh, an electric returner, too. Like, he was just a, a player that you could utilize everywhere. And listen, like, the Patriots, like, there's no team that cherishes uh, versatility like they do. Like, they don't care what you're supposed to be doing. As long as you could do what they're going to throw you in to do, you're going to get on the field. And I think that's a big reason why they, they chose Nikhil Harry. I don't think they look at him as like Randy Moss, as like the elite separator. They understand that Nikhil Harry is an extremely versatile player, and they could use him in the screen game. I'm, you'll, we'll probably see Nikhil Harry lined up at tight end. We'll probably see him in the fucking backfield. I wouldn't be surprised if he took some snaps at quarterback. So, like, I'm excited for Nikhil Harry just because that athletic profile, what made us fall in love in the first place, is not going anywhere. Um, with yeah. Michael Gallup, the situation is – is, is fucked now, man, because he's got both Cooper and C.D. Lamb there that he's got to compete with. So, uh, I don't th – this gets tough. I don't know. No, jump in here because I'm just rambling. Yeah, I actually really like Michael Gallup, not as much as I did before the C.D. Lamb pick, but Mike and I, we brought it up on an earlier show, and what I said about, about uh, Michael Gallup is you have to have a lot of faith in every other player in this offense doing what we expect them to do for you to lose faith in Michael Gallup, whether it's CeeDee Lamb in his rookie year, which has been a struggle for like everybody outside the 2019 class, in his rookie year to build chemistry and be elite uh, in his first season, Amari Cooper overcoming his injuries, his inconsistencies on the field, Blake Jarwin, who everybody on Twitter seems to think he's good. Other Fuck like, Fuck dude, him. Fucking Jason Witten beat him out last year. Put, now that, they're bringing Scott, Mike put that Scott gif of me. You know, <laughs> Fuck him. <laughs> right after the Blake. actually looked exactly like it. Uh, and then on top of that, Mike McCarthy isn't one who likes to feed running backs. Obviously, Zeke is going to get his. But I think what Michael Gallup showed us last year is he is like a perfect complementary wide receiver. Now, obviously, with CeeDee Lamb being as good as he is and Amari Cooper being there, it's hard to see him be like the clear-cut number two wide receiver in Dallas. But looking at Amari Cooper's contract, he can be cut after 2021 for $6 million, which, I mean, it's, it's let's, pretty Let's far think about it this way. How many – how many groups of wide receivers have we, have we seen in the NFL be as good as these three guys together? Maybe the Rams, but that's like about it. Okay, so we have the Rams. And there was a one year in Washington with like Crowder, Pierre Garcon, and Deshaun. Okay, calm down over there. <laughs> 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 Fucking Crowder. Um, but my, the, the reason I'm bringing this up is because 
we very rarely ever see three wide receivers as good together. And if yep. that's the case, how long do they stay together? You know, like everyone needs to eat. Everyone needs to get their money. Everyone needs to get on the field. These three wide receivers, two wide receivers you could see. Like we've seen that plenty of times. But three wide receivers, more often than not, one of them is going to get moved or, you know, traded or, or something's going to happen sooner rather than later. So I feel like most people have the mindset like, oh, fuck, Gallup is now – the number three, and I'm guilty of this as well. Gallup is now going to sooner than later be the wide receiver three for the entirety of CeeDee Lamb's contract. Like, we don't know what's going to happen with Cooper. We don't know what's going to happen with Gallup. One of those two might be traded. We, we very rarely ever see a trio of wide receivers this good stay together for more than fucking one year, two years at the max. So I think Gallup, the fact that he's shown how good he was at a young age – he's not done. Like I think of the same way, you know, with guys like, like Marlon Mack, who's been written off and he's like done with dynasty. He's like 24 years old next off season. He could be like the starter for fucking San Francisco. What if they sign him to a one year, $7 million, two years, 12, you know what I mean? Like I could see those being comparable players where they're so young, they've shown success and there's a very good chance, a very high likelihood that Michael Gallup or Amari Cooper ends up elsewhere sooner than most people expect. And the thing yeah. about Michael Gallup, too, is what was he, like a third-round pick? Like, he has an extremely cheap contract for the next few years. Like, if somebody yeah. trades for him, they're getting a very good receiver at a very cheap price tag. It's obviously going to take a lot to get him off of Dallas's hands. But as Nick said, like, there aren't many situations where he'd be traded to, where he'd be anything less than a wide receiver, too. And we've seen what he's done in that role, playing, again, playing alongside a guy like Amari Cooper, who is more talented and a better receiver, despite that, putting up, like, 1,100 yards in his second year in the NFL. Yeah, I mean, look, look, Michael Gallup, I think, you know, he's someone where, like, I was out early on in the season when everyone's like, oh, my God, Amari Cooper's getting traded. Michael Gallup, wide receiver one. I don't I don't really see that. Uh, but now that, like, CeeDee Lamb's been drafted, I think people are leaving him dead. I think a wide receiver four price for someone like him who's produced at his age is just absolutely ridiculous and i'd be totally willing to definitely invest at that price you know all of us have met as a wide receiver three and that's not a disrespect to him either it's just that like the wide receiver class is so deep uh but he is young right like and, and in terms of like you know guys I'm, I'm more cautious about investing in guys like marlon mack and trying to hope that they get a new contract because like running backs i feel like are very different yeah uh, just, just the receivers. principle of it is, is that yeah. like people look at situations with young players way too in depth and act like, yeah. especially with wide receivers who have much, much more longevity. Like he could be on three fucking more teams by the time he retires. You much know? more, much more what? Longevity. What the fuck? Longevity? What the fuck is that? I'm making up words over here. I can't <laughs> what I want. My fucking channel. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, dude, I totally agree with you. Now he took over. Yeah, yeah, dude. I, I, I totally agree. I think that, I think happy, people deal. Be happy you're on here. <laughs> I think I think people deal just like too much in the extremes you know it's like oh now that CeeDee Lamb's drafted Gallup is dead or like now that Jonathan Taylor's drafted like Marlon Mack is dead there's like a range of outcomes that can happen Lamb could bust Omar Cooper could get hurt you know Gallup could be traded like a lot of I things can happen say, say Taylor so, could bust uh no that that's impossible <laughs> so that, that's not gonna happen but uh for Michael Gallup I think there's a there's a lot of things that can go right for him as well and if he just balls out another year and gets signed somewhere else like I'm I'm still buying uh, on that train. So at a wide receiver four price, you guys just have to cop the buy button on Michael Gallup. And this one's a coin flip for me. I'm probably gonna go 50, 50. Like if I need someone to produce right now, I'm going to go Gallup. But if I'm trying to play for the long term, I'm still going to try and stick with my boy, Harry, a lot of the time that kind of wraps up the verses. Hopefully you guys like this, you know, we're probably gonna do a lot more player level deep dives like this going forward, trying to help you guys, you know, trade, identify trade targets and a lot of roster management type stuff. So, um, but yeah, that's it. That's it for this week. So unless you guys got something else to add other than that, make sure you cop the draft guide, you know, Nick just freaking grinded it out and put out the redraft content in there. So for all you guys playing redraft, assuming there's a season, uh, which right now is looking more and more kind of, you know, up in the air, Stop. unfortunately, but uh, we're going to assume there's a season. So cop the draft guide, Prepare for your redraft. Watch all our videos here. Get on Dynasty. You know, there's a lot of things going on. We're going to keep pumping out content on here, on TikTok, on Twitter, everywhere. Just just get on that shit. Follow us everywhere. Subscribe everywhere. And pop. Yes. yes.